That's great. Thank you very much. My name is Marila Miguel, and uh, welcome to a webinar on MI 43101 Technical Report, Basics and Kids Talk. We have an hour for this webinar, and you may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. I'll be compiling these questions, which will be addressed as speakers at the end of today's presentation. Today's session is a follow-up to the webinar on the overview of NI43101 and mining disclosure basics, which was presented last month by OSC staff, Craig Wally and Jim Wong. For those of you who missed this excellent presentation, the slides can be downloaded from our website at www.pgo.ca. Today, we welcome back Craig Wally and Jim White to present on common disclosure pitfalls and examples of good disclosure as among the number of areas that we will touch on. Craig and Jim are both senior geologists at the Corporate Finance Department of Ontario Securities Commission. They specialize in reviewing technical disclosures by issuers in mining and petroleum sectors. Craig and Jim are both registered professional geoscientists in Ontario. And I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge their contribution, because over the years, they have lent their knowledge and expertise in educating CGO licensees and other industry professionals about NR43-101 and the importance of compliance in, with standards of technical disclosure. So everyone, please welcome our speakers, Craig Waldy and Jim Wang. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, this is this is Craig speaking, and I'd like to thank everyone for uh, taking the time out of the schedule today to listen to our, our webinar. Um, as I mentioned, my name's Craig, and my colleague here is Chris Jim, and we'll um, we'll try to give you a good overview of technical reports on quite a high level. So this is a high level overview, we're not going item by item, um, but hopefully we'll give you a, a good understanding of. of the requir general requirements of a technical report and where some of the pitfalls and, and challenges we sometimes see when we do reviews of technical reports. So to start off with, just a little bit of caution uh, required to make you aware that these are views of staff and not necessarily the views of the commission. Uh, it doesn't constitute legal advice. It's highly summarized uh, for presentation purposes. And as always, the disclosure is the responsibility of the company. So we've got two sort of main sections we'll be discussing this morning. Uh, one relates to high-level overview of technical reports, so the basics. And the second part, we're going sort of phase by phase from exploration to production and the disclosure that is required in technical reports uh, based sort of on those different stages of production. It's very high level. We'll be sort of just briefly discussing each, uh, providing some of the do's and don'ts, and then um, items in the technical report that are, that are sort of key fatal flaw areas uh, based on the stage that the, production, the project is at. So I'll do the first section, half of uh, the second one, exploration and production, and Jim will take over at the end. We'll try to leave enough time for question and answers, but depending on, on that, we'll, we'll see how much time we have remaining. So from a high level, we'll sort of try to set the context of technical reports. We'll first have a, a graph showing basically the last the 19 years uh, of the filings of technical reports. So uh, we've got an estimate for 2019, and it's about 600. We don't know if that's where it's going to be, but it's probably based on prior trends. So it's actually probably down from the last several years. Um, the green line is the index metal price, so in the trend of the eight commodity um, index, and there's a bit of a, a down dip in that as well. So we can sort of see there is quite a, uh, a consistency with you know, metal prices and companies filing reports. Filing reports is basically as companies advance a project, they may trigger a report. So it, it shows it's sort of a um, um, earmark for um, activity in the mining sector. So you can see 2011, 2012 is a real peak 
for metal prices and a speech for a number of tech support files across Canada. If you want to sort of have a high level, you know, what are the main themes or main um, concepts around technical reports, this slide will give you that high level overview. The who, what, when, where, why, and how. So tech reports are required to be prepared by qualified persons. Um, often they're required to be independent, but that's not every case, but typically they are prepared by independent qualified persons. It provides a summary of the technical information about material property. The technical reports are only triggered on material property, material to the issuer, not all technical, not all property. Um, when are they triggered? Well, there's, there's basically milestone events, and we'll give you a slide that talks about that in the next slide. Um, so there's events and triggers for technical reports, and then a filing um, time frame, which either has to be filed with the disclosure that triggers the um, technical report, or it can be 45 days after. So filed publicly on CDAR, so they're available public, uh, publicly available documents. The, why they're filed, basically the concept is there's a support company's technical disclosure around its milestone or material event and to assist investors in understanding um, the company's mineral property. And there's a prescribed form. So the second report has a specific form that must be followed, a uh, specific table of contents, and that's the form 43101F1. And then there's the overall 4401 requirement which, which also um, relates to, to the disclosure that's made publicly available. So there's a specific, specific form. These are the main triggers for technical reports, sort of summarized and then boxed into two main um, themes. So there's property milestones, which could be sort of success triggers of companies actually advancing the project, or sometimes there's um, there's a step back, right? So there's actually a material change on the downside. Now, is there an increase in resources and reserves or a first time disclosure of resources and reserves? There's actually a decrease with material enough to trigger a report. So that's sort of a property milestone. And within that, the most common one is the first one, that first time disclosure of in resources of CEA or in reserve. Typically, that's in a news release. Um, and then if there's a material change to any of those, that's another, that's a separate trigger that could come later. Then there's the company milestones, which are more uh, related to how a company is, is, its activities as a company itself, whether it's coming to the market for the first time, whether it's filing a prospectus, um, there's maybe a takeover bid, there's different activities as a company that may trigger a report. Um, one allowance is that if a company has an existing report that's been filed um, and they say you file a short form prospectus, typically they can rely on the existing technical report um, unless it's no longer current. But typically the triggers that are there generally can rely on existing reports. If that trigger is there in the company milestone, um, the technical report is required to be filed with that disclosure. But if the, um, for the property milestone, that's generally a 45 day delay um, in the filing. So independence, independence comes in in certain instances and, and where it, it does, all qualified persons signing off on the technical report need to be independent. And the, the situation for the, for that report requires independence are, are listed there. So first time reporting in Canada, so you're coming to the market for the first time, or you're filing a long form prospectus, which is typically an IPO prospectus, that requires independence. Um, if you're advancing the project and you have disclosure of mineral resources, EA or mineral reserves for the first time, that requires independence, or a 100% or greater change in the mineral resource or mineral reserves, that again, triggers independence. But within that, there's an overarching exemption for producing issuers, which is a sort of a revenue threshold that's marked there. So producing issuers can provide in-house special reports for all those 
triggers um, if they meet the produce and issuer test. And, and sometimes we can question the SQP's objectivity where they say they're independent. Um, um, we had situations where, um, in an IPO prospectus, the, the author of the technical report appeared to be independent, but upon further review, it, it was found that actually he owned the adjoining ground. Uh, so we sort of questioned how, you know, objectivity of having a report when you actually own the adjacent ground, and if there's success on on the OP, um, IPO property, you know, there's a, there's an issue there. So it, the independent test is related to a reasonable investor test. So the reasonable investor, aware of all the facts. Think that the QP is independent or not. So that's, that's the threshold. And then this issue around technical courts with multiple projects. The concept is there needs to be basically one technical report um, that's prepared on a property basis, not a project basis. And property is defined in 42101 as a, a sort of a series of claims or a uh, basically tenure uh, where the projects or the deposits are in such close proximity that they be developed using common infrastructure. So if eventual production would use say a central processing plant or a central mill, all those deposits that may be not um, contiguous claims but they're in close proximity need to be one in one technical report. And then we have the the form of the tech report, this is the table of contents, so the items, 20, 27 items. And you can think of sort of two, two general types of uh, tech reports by stages. So an early stage um, tech report would be sort of an exploration or a report supporting mineral resources. So it only has resources or it's just exploration. Then you would include items 1 to 14 is in gray and 23 to 27 in gray. If it's a more advanced stage project, so it has a, sort of an economic analysis related to a PEA, it has reserves, or it's a project that's actually in production, you need to include all 27 items, including the ones that are in blue. So those, the blue ones are for advanced properties. And if you look at a very high level, sort of, this is marked as a high level fatal flaw checklist for all stages, all types of technical reports. So this is only a partial list. This isn't, isn't everything, but it's sort of the main sort of areas that we would you know, typically review if we're doing a quick check of a technical report. Um, these are sort of the main, main areas where we would sort of check first to see if there's any, any issues, any red flags. So the QP certificate, uh, do they have the relevant experience? Do, are they independent if required? And do they belong to a professional association that's recognized? Um, also, at least one QP needs to do a site visit. So we'll check the certificate to make sure that those items are, are consistent with the requirements. Quick look at the summary section, making sure it sort of seems to be uh, a good explanation of, of the project, what was done, and, and what, what the tech report is to support. Like, is it first time disclosure of resources or reserves? So, what's the, what's the triggering event? So, the reliance on other expert <clears throat> section that's typically a problem where the, I'm sorry, second area where we see problems. Um, either they're relying on other QPs and potentially disclaiming responsibility for that other technical information. What reliance on other experts? meant to be for is for non-QP reliant, non-technical information reliance. So <clears throat> a, a title opinion, environmental assessment, uh, tax information, that's that's what needs to be in that area, not relying on a metallurgical review by somebody and your that metallurgist is not actually signing off on the report. That's that would be an issue. Expiration stage, typically the issue there would be around disclosure of an expiration target or historical estimate. There is one, making sure it meets the requirements. Uh, data verification is a very key area and very key as you move through definitely into a resource. First time disclosure of a resource, we're really going to 
drill down on the data verification section to see what the QP did to verify the data. If the project is at mineral resources or mineral reserves, for sure we're going to look at, again, the verification of the data and how the QP was able to get comfortable relying on data, typically like legacy data, historical data that is maybe used in a resource estimate. Then there's disclosure requirements around assumptions. Um, do they use best practices? And have they constrained the resource in some way, either on open pit, underground, other constraints related to, to that pit shell or, or underground uh, mineable, mineable shapes underground? And then as you move through a project which is maybe at an economic analysis stage, reserves or PEA, making sure those are used correctly, the tax has been applied with reasonable sensitivity analysis, environmental social, again, very key areas. We'll look at, at the disclosure around that. And finally, in the you know, conclusion section around the risk and potential risk. So those are sort of the main high level areas we will, we will review uh, first. So we'll go into sort of the stage by stage um, we'll again, we'll look at it through sort of the, um, you know, the do's and, you know, a little overview, a little bit of the do's and don'ts, and then the critical areas and technical reports at those stages of, of development. So we'll use this um, arrow to sort of um, start for each each stage that we go through. Uh, it's meant to show on the x-axis the increase in time, the y-axis, the project value. So we're starting sort of five main stages that we'll talk about, exploration, mineral resources, PEA, mineral reserves based on a pre-feasibility study, and production. And the stars are meant to show where tech reports um, would be triggered to support each of those main three, uh, three events, resource, PEA, and reserve. So for exploration, do's and don'ts, uh, what we sort of tried to do here was take the requirements and put them into quick little um, you know, cards, basically, to show you sort of at a high level what you should be aware of, make sure you do this, and don't do the other thing. So I won't go through them all, but basically these are, you know, report all your results, good and bad. So the exploration information, report all um, drill holes. Um, now, not necessarily for a technical report, you have to talk about every drill hole, but this is more talking maybe about, uh, you know, if you're in a news release, you've drilled five holes, you have to talk about the results for the five, even if three were not, uh, were not good holes. Uh, if you're reporting historical estimates, exploration targets, make sure it's done correctly. Um, the drill hole location, so you need to see sort of like a map that shows the plan and maybe some sections and to show where these drill holes are in 3D space. Uh, the don'ts, um, don't report visual estimates, either in a news release or in a technical report. Um, true width, if you have a, a project that has uh, drilled through a structure, try to give some understanding of whether that was a drill interval or a true width interval. And if you don't know, you have to state that. And don't do economics on historical estimates or exploration targets. There's a lot sort of X in, in the list there. So these are pretty straightforward, uh, but these are a high level of do's and don'ts with exploration information. And for a technical report at the exploration stage, again, this is just a partial list. And you need to go to the bottom right where it says plus items noted in the fatal flaw checklist. Like, so the fatal flaw checklist has a certificate, right? So we don't not showing that again. But what we're looking at here is some of the things for an exploration stage. Um, with regards to site visit, and uh, will be described in the introduction what the QP did. Um, for the property, do they have rights to the property? Uh, are they able to actually do work on the property? Or is there some impediment, local or environmental impediment? Um, the historical work, has that work actually been done on the company's current property? Or is it, are they just describing historical work in the area? So the idea is you describe Make sure it's clear whether that historical drilling that you're discussing, whether it was on the company's current property or just an adjacent ground. For exploration and, and drilling, this is meant to be for what 
work was done by the company itself since it's acquired the property. The sampling prep item 11 is a requirement for the QP to provide an opinion on the adequacy of the procedures uh, done for the sampling. Data verification in a key area, um, even on the exploration stage, but uh, it is a key area for verifying the data and the QP's opinion on the data uh, adequacy for that stage of a project. So early stage exploration, um, there may not be available information, but that's um, at this stage, it's less critical than other resource groups. And then item 14, there shouldn't be any more resource estimate disclosure whatsoever. This would clearly say uh, no resource estimate, no current resource estimate. The adjacent property area, sometimes you see for exploration projects, a lot of description about all the neighbors, properties, um, their successes. Uh, make sure that that's not you know, three quarters of the technical report. Sometimes we see adjacent property section uh, basically amounts to the, 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 the most of the pages in that whole technical report itself. Uh, interpretation, you know, there are some uncertainties and, and risks with that project and recommendation needs to be to limit, to limit the phases of work to two, two phases of work and, and uh, a budget and then is work contingent on positive results. But a high level, that's what we would sort of look for in an exploration stage report. Moving on to a resource stage report. So we're using the same graphic, now we're moving up into the resource. And first time, this actually shows where there is a trigger for first time disclosure of mineral resources. So, the term mineral resource is defined in um, GIM definition standards. The current standards are from 2014. And those GIM definitions are incorporated by reference directly into 43101, so they become part of law under 43101. Three main sort of components. There's the you know, occurrence of solid material of economic interest. The second one is probably the key. So that material needs to be in such a quantity, form, and, and quality that it has reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction. And we'll, we'll give you a bit of an Another slide sort of drilling down into that, but that's, that's sort of the, probably the key component. And then the location and the, con the continuity, the quality is, you know, uh, the characteristics are, are, are known, estimated, or interpreted based on knowledge and sample. So CIM has um, guidance on um, reasonable prospects. What it all comes down to basically is a judgment call by the qualified person whether the material has reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction. And that's based on certain sort of technical and economic factors um, that need to be disclosed. So there basically needs to be a clear justification of the cutoff grade used for um, estimating the mineral resource. It also needs to have some constraints applied to it. So where we've got the main sort of technical economic factors need to be disclosed, the commodity price that's used, the logical recovery, the type of mining method and processing method that it is projected to be used, and costs related to mining processing and GMA. So typically in a technical port or mineral resource, we want to see a section that, that describes Reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction and goes through those criteria that have been used by the qualified person to justify the, that, the mineral, that the material has reasonable prospects. And the little thing below the blue line at the end is it's something we sometimes see in forward looking information statements, but it's kind of it's a good way of thinking about resources. So, resource estimates are basic expressions of professional judgment and opinion based on sufficient knowledge, uh, level of knowledge, relevant experience, and awareness of industry best practices. So they are basically expressions of judgment and opinion by the qualified person. And we see various levels of, say, professional judgment or QP judgment um, when we review technical reports with mineral resource estimates. So there's a, there tends to be a, quite a variation in 
uh, what the QP has used to uh, justify the, the mineral results. Starting right from the basic to the detailed, the basic would be they just use an analogous deposit. So they use, okay, we're using a, we're using a one gram cutoff, so that seems reasonable for this type of a deposit. And that's a level of disclosure, which is not really adequate. And we would have a lot of questions about that, but sometimes we see that that type of a justification, just an analogous deposit, so that sort of uh, assumed or a, a chosen cutoff rate. Next up, we got sort of we have the metal price and mining method, so we're using say fourteen hundred dollar gold and it's open pit type deposit. So the cutoff grade would sort of be reasonable for uh, that metal price and that type of of mining compared to underground mining. Then the most common and the one typically we would we would say would be best practice would be where you've got a constraint, you've got a pit shell, an underground slope block. So you have all those assumptions that went into the determination of that pit shell shape, depth, and all that. So all those assumptions. And that that's probably typically what we see most um, um, second parts done by large consulting firms, or it's just the more typical of today. That's what we see. And then there's the ones where say maybe there's an internal PEA, so the internal scoping study. Uh, so the some of the larger firms they want to get more comfortable with the uh, with the assumptions that they've chosen are, are reasonable. So they'll they'll go ahead. They're not going to disclose the scoping study economic analysis, but they'll use the inputs in order to constrain constrain the deposit. But as we sort of you know, when you look at tech reports, there is quite a significant um, variation in professional practice and, and professional judgment. Some potential and misleading um, types of disclosure around these are estimates. If the if company is say, reporting either a global estimate or mineral inventory or an unconstrained estimate, we're definitely going to have questions and challenges uh, or challenge the company to justify um, that type of disclosure because it doesn't meet the definition standard, um, regional prospects, and doesn't meet the best practice. Also, if they don't include the actual discussion about those parameters that are used to justify the estimate, such as the mining method, metallurgy, cost, assumptions, that's, that's a challenge or a problem. Uh, if the cutoff grade doesn't seem reasonable for the type of mining method, if they're using a the open pit for a potential underground deposit, you can question that. Get the QP to justify or explain why they have chosen that type of a cutoff. Um, we don't see that too often, but sometimes we've seen reports where one deposit that they've chosen uh, um, different cutoffs for different metals within the same deposit. So a copper cutoff, a gold cutoff, or a deposit where it's actually just one homogeneous deposit, but there's these two cutoffs. And the project is, as they indicated, a measured resources, which means you can move that material into reserve. We don't have any metallurgical sampling at that point. We would see a question whether that actually meets the definition, whether you have the certainty that those are measured and indicated that could be used in reserves if you haven't done any metallurgy whatsoever. So some of the do's and don'ts for resource estimate stage. Effective date, that's a key. Need to describe what the scores with the effective date. That could be the date of the second report now. It could be the date six months ago when the estimate was prepared. Um, a second report can be current for a number of years. So that effective date is key. The tons and grade need to be reported, not just contain metal. The assumptions around justifying the resource need to be disclosed. And some of the don'ts don't report gross metal values, don't, don't sort of move material that sort of potentially sounds like it is the preserves when it's not, it's just resources, so don't use the term or. Uh, make sure when you have a tech report that includes the measured and inferred and inferred resources, you don't add inferred with the other categories of resources, and make sure that you follow the, the CIM um, best practices and definition standards. So on a resource stage for a technical report, again, high level, we need to sort of look at the data flaw checklist and the expiration stage checklist. 
but here's sort of the main things again with the resource testing for where we'll sort of focus our initial review. Certificate around relevant experience. Does the qualified person appear to have relevant experience in doing resource assessments? So look for that type of disclosure. We look around, make sure the QP has an opinion stated regarding the sample press and an opinion stated regarding data verification. And we'll definitely drill down into looking at if there's a lot of historical work, which projects, you know, multiple operators will generally be working on a property until the, the, the current operator is there now, maybe data from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. How is the QP dealing with legacy data? Is it, are they doing enough checks to be comfortable they can use that data? Or are they saying that data really isn't reliant or, or relevant? Maybe relevant, but it's not reliable at this point. How are they dealing with the legacy data? We'll look into that. Metallurgical testing. We want to see that at least there's some level of metallurgical testing done. And the resource testing itself. Sort of a high level checklist of the stages the QP would go through in, in sort of having a resource database, looking at variograms, block models, classifying the deposit, making sure it has reasonable prospects, the cutoff grade, reasonable prospects for that deposit, and a statement of an effective date. So those are the key areas that we'll look at um, when a project is at a, a mineral resource stage. So we're gonna look at other, all the other items as well, but this is what we'll drill down to, to first. So, and with that, I'll move on to uh, let Jim take over. Thanks, Ray. So um, at this stage, uh, where, where there's a preliminary economic assessment, then the advanced property definition kicks in. The advanced property definition is, is right up in the front of the rule. And it means that your technical report must include item 16 to 22, the design and costing section. And uh, that also means in turn that, that uh, you've got to have mining engineers and metallurgists getting involved as QP authors here. This is, this is really the point where you've gone beyond what the geologist can do. Uh, one other thing to, to know is, is that there is a requirement uh, that a technical report contain all material scientific and technical information. So that may also require some of that item 16 to 22 uh, information in a, in a technical report that's on an earlier stage property. Even though you might not be putting out uh, economic estimates, uh, there still might be uh, there, there still might be facts on the ground, whether it's, it's underground workings or uh, or a, a mill on the, on the property or something like that that makes it necessary to describe everything that's there. So uh, preliminary economic assessment is, is largely defined by what it ain't. Uh, it's not a preliminary feasibility study or a feasibility study. So that kind of leaves any kind of early stage economics. And that, that, is, that is what preliminary economic assessment disclosure turns out to be in that circumstance. It, it, it's economic information that, that is not backed up by, uh, by at least the feasibility study. Um, and this is actually one of the reasons we disallow gross values like $60 billion in the ring of fire, that uh, these, these are, that's, that's economic information that people are going, to, are going to think equates to a cash flow when really it's not. So uh, basically a PEA is, is what uh, other jurisdictions will often refer to as a scoping study. And it's, uh, it's a, an economic study that can be based on mineral resources of any kind rather than just measured and indicated resources and anything that includes forecast production rates or capital costs operating costs cash flows that kind of thing will will raise a flag as preliminary preliminary economic analysis disclosure uh, if uh, if it shows up in in the company's disclosure record So uh, just a little diagram to, uh, to, to make the distinction clear here. Uh, you, you'll notice there's a, a hard line between preliminary economic assessment and preliminary feasibility studies. And, and that hard line is, is that a preliminary economic assessment is insufficient to 
classify a resource as a reserve. And uh, that also means that it is not sufficient to, to fully justify a production decision. Doesn't mean that a company can't make a production decision based on a PEA, but that they have done so in, in a way that is, that is risk, risky. And that is why we have prescribed risk language for production decisions as well. Uh, you'll also see uh, percentage figures for, for the amount of engineering that's been done and for the cost accuracy. Uh, I should say they're not hard and fast numbers. They're, they're, uh, they're ballpark numbers for, for the amount of engineering that's going on and for the cost accuracy that can be expected from the study. And of course, the, the, you'll, you'll see there the, the output of the, of the study right on the last line. Uh, a preliminary economic assessment takes resources in and you get only resources out. The distinction there, pre-feasibility and feasibility studies, is that you actually get provable, provable, probable and proven reserves out. In 2012, we put out a staff notice on uh, preliminary economic assessments, and, and that was in response to uh, a lot of uh, a lot of problems we had seen with disclosure following the last revision of uh, NI 43101. Uh, we essentially loosened up the uh, the requirements or the, loosened up the restrictions on uh, on disclosure of preliminary economic assessments. It used to be that if you had a mineral reserve. That was, your, that was your disclosure and that was your economic disclosure. Uh, you couldn't add anything on to that. Um, that was relaxed and, and we started to see uh, some, some uh, fairly, uh, fairly loose use of the idea of a preliminary economic assessment. So basically we, we, wanted, to, uh, we wanted to close off the idea that people could use uh, a preliminary assessment as a proxy for for a preliminary feasibility study, that they could do these things in conjunction with a preliminary feasibility study or feasibility study and just put the numbers anywhere, uh, or that they uh, could disclose economic information without triggering a technical report. So the first thing is, is that you shouldn't pretend you have a PEA in order to evade declaring a reserve or to backdoor insert resources into your economic model. That, that's, that's a misuse of the PEA. Uh, secondly, we don't want to see double counting. We don't want to see reserves that go into a preliminary feasibility studies economic analysis and then the company turns around and uses them again in, in a preliminary economic assessment because people will uh, inevitably add up those cash flows and you know, when, uh, when Two different cash flows are coming from the same chunk of rock. That's uh, that's definitely misleading. And the other thing that we had seen uh, was was attempts to backdoor byproducts that aren't in the mineral resource estimate into the economic model, and that uh, that is not reasonable either. So. In the case where you have a reserve estimate and uh, the company wants to do a preliminary economic assessment on some resources that it has, first of all, don't use the PEA to update, modify, or add to the life of mine plan. That's not, that's not how it works. The idea for, for a PEA is that there is a separate project or a separate expansion that it is, uh, where it is justifying further work. Not that it's actually justifying production or that it can be added on to the expected cash flows for an operating mine. Um, don't include mineral reserves in the preliminary economic assessment. So that avoids the double counting. Don't incorporate inferred resources into the same production profile, economic, economic analysis, cash flow, or mine time that's based on the reserve. And don't try and treat the PEA as if it has the same level of detailed mine design as a life of mine plan. Um, and another one is don't ever try an economic analysis or a cash flow projection on anything less than a mineral resource. We've seen that too, and that's definitely misleading. So the do's and don'ts here um, definitely provide a clear, state, clear statement of the main assumptions. Definitely prepare the analysis on a 100% equity basis. 
if the if the company is not putting up all the money, uh, that that's a good way to gear preliminary economic assessments and get additional cash flows out. That is potentially misleading too. The PEA should be done as if the company is putting up all all the investment. Always include the, the required cautionary language. That's that's a requirement of the rule, but it's also necessary to to caution the reader that this is preliminary and it and it's not something they can hang their hat on as an investment decision. Use a reasonable range for the sensitivity analysis. A narrow sensitivity uh, means your technical report can easily become outdated. You can have the, the economic rug pulled out from under it by any kind of economic changes in price in cost, in, uh, in discount rate. So uh, a reasonable range from the sensitivity analysis, a wider range, allows that report to, to hold up in circumstances where, where the economics at the time of the, the report was expected have changed. And don't confuse the terms. Don't, uh, don't describe something that's really a preliminary economic analysis as a pre-feasibility study or vice versa. The don't, uh, don't disclose an economic analysis on an expiration target or historical estimate. Uh, you can't do it on expiration targets. You can't do it on historical estimates, which are essentially other people's numbers. You can't do it on mineral potential. You can't do it on your pie in the sky ambitions for exploration. You should report only, you should not report only pre-tax values. Everybody gets taxed. You must show after-tax values in a preliminary economic assessment, just as you should in a pre-feasibility study or feasibility study. Everybody pays taxes. Uh, everybody also has a cost of capital, so don't use an unrealistic discount rate. Don't quote, don't try and and say that this is your total cash flow over over the period and not discount it out uh, out to the years where it'll actually be getting that cash flow. Uh, don't combine the outcomes of the PEA with the outcomes based on reserve. Adding those two cash flows together can be very misleading. Don't misuse the PEA level study in, in any way by, by trying to backdoor insert it into, into, uh, into what should be a reserve estimate. And uh, don't, uh, don't hide the risks that, are, that you're taking on if you decide to produce from a mineral resource rather than a mineral reserve. So at the, at the PEA stage, the, the uh, pitfalls of the technical report are uh, making sure that QPs have relevant experience with mining studies. The geologist has to be in to provide the mineral resource. The mining engineer has to be there to provide the mine design. The metallurgist has to be there to provide the plant design. Uh, everybody, this has to be a, a, a full spectrum technical team at once you're, once you're at the stage of, of, of design and economics. Uh, pitfalls for the mineral resource estimate are really very much the same. You need uh, a you need a reliable mineral resource to do any kind of any kind of design or or costing work on it. Uh, then we, you're introducing item 16 to 22 of the technical report here. The mining method you need a proposed mining method and production rate. I have seen uh, things that were called preliminary economic assessments. Uh, and they had cost estimates without any kind of design of the mine or plant at all, which seemed kind of funny to me. Uh, similarly, not just, not just the mine, not just the plant, but the infrastructure is part of your cost. The market studies and contracts, they govern, uh, they govern the kind of revenue a, a project is going, is going to get. And for commodities that don't have a, a terminal market, things like the industrial minerals, uh, the battery minerals like lithium and graphite, uh, the, the minor metals, those don't have uh, a, a public price history that, uh, that the QP can go on. There have to be good studies backing up what kind of revenue is expected from those commodities. There are always big issues now related to project risk and maintaining social license. That's got to go into the technical report. The capital and operating costs are at PEA cost accuracy. It's not a pre-feasibility pre study or a feasibility study. 
So explain and justify the basis for the cost estimates and, and don't hide the error bars on. And of course, the, the economic analysis should be post-tax, should have a reasonable discount rate, and should have a wide enough sensitivity analysis that it's going to be fairly robust. Uh, the next stage where, where technical reports are likely to be triggered is, is the declaration of mineral reserve. Uh, that is synonymous with the completion of a preliminary feasibility study. You don't have reserves without a pre-feasibility study. You don't have a pre-feasibility study that doesn't, uh, that doesn't um, bring you to a, a proven and probable reserve. So definition of a mineral reserve um, is, is that it's the economically, economically mineable part of measured and indicated resources. That means you can't add in first. And it's defined by a pre-feasibility level study that demonstrates that mining is justified after taking into account all relevant modifying factors. And those are the things that are described in item 16.22 of, of the technical report. Uh, the mineral reserve has to include dilution and allowance for losses. Uh, it, should, it should state the reference point where the mineral reserves are defined. Now, typically for a metal mine, that is the point where the ore is delivered to the processing plant. So this, uh, the, the mineral reserve is the actual mill feed that the plant is going to get. Uh, for industrial minerals and, and other commodities, it may be defined a little bit differently, particularly depending on, on what kind of uh, uh, downstream, uh, what kind of downstream processing is, is going to go on with it. And reserves are defined by studies at pre-feasibility or feasibility level that demonstrate at the time of reporting that extraction could be justified, which brings the, uh, the effective date of the, uh, of the mineral reserve in, into play here. It's at the time of reporting. You'll all be familiar with the with the McKelvey box. Uh, I guess the thing to say about it here is, is that uh, going down that blue arrow on the left hand side from, from inferred through to indicated measured resources is uh, a question of observational science. That's the geologist's job. You drill your way to indicated and measured resources. But when you start going across the box on that red arrow, you're designing and costing your way across the box. That is that engineering and estimation of cost, and you estimate your way to a reserve. And uh, in a survey of 49 industry representatives back in 2015, when uh, this is a this is a very very hot topic uh, because uh, a lot of projects had uh, turned into disasters on on uh, on major mining companies. The top five factors for capital cost overruns that, that the industry representatives named were aggressive and unrealistic schedule. Uh, if uh, something, if, if a wrench gets thrown into the work at, at any point, then uh, you're, you're going to start getting capital cost overruns simply, simply through the delay. Uh, a lack of properly developed test work, defined design criteria or work scope. Uh, if there are surprises when you get to the design stage, that's going to that's going to bog things down, and that is going to cost money. The client putting pressure on to minimize initial capital requirements, uh, shoving off um, shoving off capital expenditures into into later years, and things like that, were definitely a way to to make sure that your project was was over ran over. Uh, underestimating or having insufficient critical data from the early engineering study and overestimating the accuracy and underestimating the contingency. Uh, contingency is, is not uh, a, a reserve of money for surprises. It's a reserve of money for all of the things that don't quite fit in the estimate that you've already done. So, in technical report on mineral reserve estimates, always provide the effective date. Uh, report both guns and grades. That's, that's a simple matter of compliance with the rule. There, there is no reserve estimate that doesn't have both tons and grade. Um, provide the 
key assumptions, parameters, and methods that have gone into it. Now, that, that means, in the end, having a, a complete and current technical report, but it also means that in other disclosure, you know, someone, uh, the, the company news releases the, uh, the results of, of, of a reserve estimate, uh, those key assumptions, parameters, and methods are supposed to be disclosed every time. Account for all of the modifying factors. Don't leave stuff out. Um, note if the resources are reported inclusive or exclusive of the reserves. That's another rule requirement, and it's one that people often don't think about. I once did uh, four continuous disclosure reviews in a row on companies with uh, mineral resources and mineral reserves, and none of them got it right. Uh, it, it's necessary always to say which convention that you're using, whether you're reporting. Uh, the reserves as part of the mineral resource, or whether you're reporting the reserves and then the resources in addition to the reserves. Uh, last last point there in the dues, make use of section 3.5 of 43101. 3.5 is, is a neat little way to use previous disclosure in, uh, in uh, Previous technical reports in previous annual information forms or any other file file document, and in general disclosure of mineral reserve information, it is always okay to refer back to an earlier technical report. Now, the the consequence for actual technical reports on mineral reserves is that all that information should be in the technical report, and that is what will enable the company later on to use that technical report under the under the section 3.5 provision to um, to allow them to uh, you know not do a 16 page uh, news release to uh, to list all of their key assumptions parameters and methods if the uh, if the information is all in a previously filed document like the technical report they can simply refer back to that among the don'ts uh, don't report only contains metal. Again, that's that. Uh, that and gross values are both prohibited by the rule. Don't uh, don't invent categories. Don't use non-compliant reserve modifiers. Don't report estimates without the category. Don't report combined resources and reserves. They are two different things. Uh, don't convert inferred resources to reserves. A reserve has to be made up of measured and indicated resources. And don't ignore the definition standards in the best practice guidelines. They're, they are they are your anchor for whether something is or is not a mineral reserve. So at the reserve stage, the important things are again relevant experience with with mining studies for all of the key, key authors and uh, everybody being in their lane as far as, as uh, professional expertise is concerned. Uh, in the mineral resource estimate, once you have reserves, you've got to make it clear whether the resources include them or exclude them. Uh, the mineral reserve estimate, noting how they were, they, how the resources were converted to reserves, so account for all the modi modifying factors and provide those key assumptions. Uh, provide all the information in uh, items 16 to 22, and in particular, critical once you're once you're at the reserve stage. Environmental studies, permitting, social and community impact. You don't have a, a mineral. You don't have a mineral reserve if you don't have permits. If you don't have the uh, the proper infrastructure, nobody's going to let you go ahead with it. The capital and operating costs. Once you're once you're at the stage of, of calculating reserves, those capital and operating costs have to be a TFS or, or feasibility study standard. And again, the economic analysis is going to be misleading if it's not prepared for the project on a 100 percent equity basis and with a reasonable dis discount rate and analysis and sensitivity analysis range so at the production stage you'll find you won't generally need new technical reports during production the only things that are likely to trigger technical reports then are material changes to mineral resource and mineral reserve estimates or some kind of major new, new development, a major new zone going from open pit to underground, for example, or a big expansion. And technical reports at the production stage 
still need the item 15 to 22 information with the one exception that uh, a producing issuer can exclude the economics for, for a property that is in production unless there's a material expansion plan for that. If, if the new reserve estimate or if a new reserve estimate or a new mine plan is there to justify uh, a major expansion to, to the project, then you have to show that the cost of capital is justified. Otherwise, you really just, you're, you're mining to, to your cutoff rate and that's all you have to prove. So again, make sure your QPs have real, relevant experience. Remember the purpose of the report. Describe the risks and uncertainties. Always provide true, a full true and plain facts about the property. Remember the definition standards and the practice guidelines. Get somebody to look at it. Another pair of eyes is always valuable. On the don't, we don't review all the reports. It doesn't mean that because a report's been filed on CDAR that we've approved it. Don't forget your audience. Don't use the technical report as, as a 400 page, uh, 50 megabyte data dump. Uh, don't forget that there is only one current technical report. People talk about an updated technical report, but there is no such thing. There is only a new technical report and it's gotta be complete. Don't neglect the summary section. And if you want a good uh, idea of what to put in the summary, go to uh, 51102, the AIF item 5.4. Nice, nice description of, of the kind of disclosure that's needed about a mineral project, and it makes a great summary in a technical report. Don't ignore the, uh, the independence requirements for a QP, because uh, at the stage of a, of, of a new mineral reserve, the, the company may need independent QPs for everything. And uh, don't make an attempt to disclaim responsibility for technical data. If you're the author of, of the report, you should be ready to take responsibility for it. So thank you everybody for your time and uh, we can now open it up to questions.